Um, I'm very, 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 very happy to have Jim Carlson here today because he's got some equipment to show us now. So, please welcome Jim Carlson from Carlson Wireless. Come on up. Hello there. Thanks, Jack, for an excellent uh, introduction into the topic. Um, and I did have a question for you, and that is, what is, going to, what is the HAAT that you're going to be asking for? Right now, let me plug you in, Jim. It's on this side right here. Okay. No, why, don't you, why don't you do it? What HAAT are we going to be asking for? The FCC says right now, the base of our tower can be no more than 76 meters height above average terrain about 240 feet. The base of the tower, then we can go 90 feet above that. But the problem is that base of the tower ruling keeps us off of the ridges and the, the peaks where we can go on existing towers. One sec. We're asking the FCC to raise, forget about the elevation at the base of the tower. Focus on the elevation of the antenna because that's what everyone else in the country does. We're going to propose, I think, 250 meters antenna height above average terrain. So if the, if the ridge top, where the tower base is, is 250 meters height above average terrain, we can't put our antenna very high above ground, but we could still put it at ground level and use that site rather than developing a new tower site halfway down in the foothills somewhere. Question. What's the distance to calculate the average? So if you have a tower and it sits on... Oh, you draw, you draw eight radials out 10 miles around the tower location and you average the elevation, then average them all together. It's online at the FCC website, by the way. Yes, also you can go to uh, Show My White Space uh, Spectrum Bridge and you can put in your coordinates of that antenna, GPS coordinates, and it'll show right then and there the HAAT of that site. Interesting enough, some sites are minus 100 meters, depending on where, you know, if you're in the bottom of the valley, and some are plus hundreds of meters. Did you say you're asking for 250? I think we're going to ask for 250 for yeah. the antenna height. That, that, that 250 good. meters. Right, I understand. Yeah. Okay, so first, uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and um, we're excited to be on the bleeding edge, and we've got some scars, too, uh, on uh, involving the uh, this uh, unused TV channel radio system, broadband, and it's really built for rural broadband uses here. Uh, we did this in cooperation with uh, two partners we have, uh, which is Spectrum Bridge. We started working with them two years ago. Steve Coran introduced us to, uh, to them. And also KTS Wireless, who is the Coos Brothers, who uh, helped us design the radio equipment. And um, effectively, uh, the, the radio is a software-defined radio, so its waveforms can be simulated. Uh, in advance and plugged in and is a, a whole software block and so you can kind of get uh, you can predict and model what's going to occur there and optimize it. Um, and so um, basically I'll just talk a little bit of a short introduction to our company uh, to give you a kind of a background here. As soon as we get it clicked on the right item. Okay, anyways we've been around since 1986 in the rural, uh, initially voice marketplace. Uh, we built a product called the Optifilm and sold that into uh, Lex and the ILEX and eventually CLEX, uh, bringing the telephone services into Grand Canyon. All the services are provided by us. And a lot of the western states that have very rural park systems and, uh, and low density areas. Uh, as time progressed, uh, some of our product uh, moved into voice services in the public safety agencies from mountaintop to mountaintop. And then in the last uh, five years or so, we've gotten into the higher capacity Ethernet data side. Uh, so our company is basically, as we design fixed wireless products for terrain-based communications. Our equipment is in use uh, in every continent of the world. And Basically, from the North Slope, the Arctic Circle, to uh, the Antarctica, we put equipment in there in the 90s for the McMurrow base, uh, and uh, also in, you know, Africa and Latin America. Uh, our products are known for reliability, low power consumption. Uh, a lot of our equipment is solar, solar powered location. Uh, proprietary network security. We, in the, uh, in our fundamental 
products, we don't use that 802.11 uh, mechanism precisely. We modify that so it's self-encrypted. Um, and we're also known for a wide frequency uh, display and uh, TDM migration uh, with a fixed low latency. And our business is known for uh, solid customer relationships with uh, world-class customer service. At least that's what we strive for. Uh, our creative solutions for WIS would be the uh, Rural Connect IP, which is what we're going to talk about here today, and also the Long Haul uh, TDM product, which is a, uh, a TDM pro uh, solution point to point, similar to the Exalt and the Redline type of products. It's right about in the middle between the two of those uh, for a middle mile. And then we also have a product called the ST, which is a, uh, a high capacity 802.11N type product for uh, unlicensed uh, multi-point solution for last month. So an overview on the new white space radio is that it's an unlicensed device that's frequency managed through the FCC database like Jack had mentioned. The GPS coordinates on each station are used to prevent uh, interference to uh, broadcasters and wireless microphone users. Uh, it transmits into valleys and through foliage much better than you're used to with uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, the VHF signal in some cases can be received indoors, and thus subscriber equipment may be self-installed if, in your, if you're designing them correctly. And the throughputs are uh, currently comparable to DSL, and when and if we can get um, a little bit more expansion of the spectrum mask, then the throughputs can be you know, closer to uh, a Wi-Fi type product line. What kind of bandwidth do we need now? Okay, right now on the product, you know, it's, it's limited to about uh, 9.2 uh, megabits over the air, which resolves in about a 3 megabit, uh, 3 to 4 megabit throughput. Now, and that's because we're transmitting with a 2.5 uh, megahertz actual occupied bandwidth, you know, 6 megahertz channel. And that's so that this, the, uh, the, the side load that the out of band emissions are minus 55 dB down below the carrier. And, and by the okay. way, we're starting to address that with the FCC to loosen that spectral mask so we can use more of that channel. Right. To me, it, it should be either you've got adjacent channels protected as buffer zones and you're able to, you know, to transmit, you know, much more uh, unrestricted in the band or you don't have adjacent channels and you maintain a, a tight restriction. Now, um, we're also looking into concatenating or channel bonding, turbo mode for a lot of you guys. Um, and it's a very doable scenario with a software defined radio. And uh, that, um, to move to two channels is our plan in approximately March uh, to, uh, to um, June time frame. Two channels giving you 12 megahertz actually gives you about three times as much bandwidth because you don't have a guard band in the middle. Maybe four times. Uh, so, let's see. Um, as you know about showmywhitespace.com, there's also another site that's very, very interesting. And if I could have gotten the internet working here, I would show you. But an, on Spectrum Bridge, there's a site, and you may have already demonstrated this, that if you just put in, OK, who's using channel 9, and you've got a you know, US map, all the little uh, the radiuses uh, show up there. Who's using you know channel? You can click them all, and you see that still about half the U.S. is not using any TV channels. If, you know, from a geographic standpoint, in very low populated areas. So in our topology, we're looking at you know somewhere probably in the range of a 20 to 30 subscribers per access point, depending on what the service <coughs> that you're giving these subscribers and what type of subscriber they are. Um, path requirements, uh, the range typically one to four miles. Uh, we have a, a margin prediction, uh, you know, calculator. Uh, best non-line of sight coverage since CB radios is what I say to it. Um, subscriber installation, you know, we've lined out, you know, uh, an indoor model that is a customer plug and play, and then there's an outdoor model that requires a mounting on outside the house with an antenna. And that's going to depend on where they're at in the range. 
So I'll uh, demonstrate the, uh, the graphical user interface with some products operating here, uh, which will involve configuration of the uh, access point and remote and showing some of the monitoring. This is um, kind of a uh, limited feature set so far, and we have some plans to add some additional features to it. So let's see here. This is the, uh, the somewhat simplified graphic user interface. We have a, a network tree up in the corner here, and it shows that there's an access point, you know, set up as uh, 160, you know, 192, 168, 180, and then we've got dot 81 as a remote and dot 82 as another remote. So when when you op open this graphical window initially, there's it's all blank, and the thing that you need to do is put in here. Um, an IP address that would correspond to your base. Wherever you're at in your network, as long as you can tunnel to this, you put in the IP address for the base, you tell it to get, uh, and then it will fill with what information it has in that, that base unit, which in this case, um, it's going to give you the standard subnet mask, class C, broadcast, the standard uh, gateway that you that you put into the system, the MAC address, uh, a firmware server location where you might have a TFTP uh, device in your network, uh, and the white space server. And this would be the address of uh, your uh, white space server, let's say Spectrum Bridge. Uh, and then you would click operate as a TV <coughs> uh, device. And then the white space server is going to send a channel map to it based on the uh, GPS coordinates which are kept in your uh, configuration. And so on the configuration, you can choose the different types of bandwidths that you want. You can actually operate two of these or devices with a narrower bandwidth within that 6 megahertz channel space, even if you need narrower band, bandwidth uh, requirements. But uh, when we set up for the widest that's uh, right now passes the FCC rules, then it's a uh, 9.2 megabit, 2.5 uh, uh, megahertz wide uh, uh, modulation plan. And so uh, you put in the center frequency here, which in the case of channel 13, I think is 213 megahertz. Excuse me. Yeah. So uh, you put that frequency in, uh, set up your power, and uh, this device happens to be a base unit. Uh, then we go to the network, and on the network we would uh, we would update that, and we would see what the signal strengths of uh, the different remotes are, and their uh, node identification number. Question, Jim. Yep. What channel, uh, what frequency is this on right now? What channel and what frequency? Currently, it's on a licensed uh, 218, so it's in the 220 mega megahertz band. Does, not not did, knowing exactly what was going on down here, and we decided to use terminated, you know, demonstration. You know, we <coughs> could have put it on anything we wanted to. Is there a, <coughs> is there a page in there that shows the frequency versus the channel numbers? There should or, be. <laughs> okay. Because it would be a lot easier if we had the channel mapped, you know, to this. And, uh, so that brings up a really good point that I'll make a note of here. Are you waiting on a database for that to automatically propagate all that? Kind of right. You you would put in your what we should have is a couple in here that you choose your top five, you know, desired channels, right. and that what you would do is is that you would be sent a channel map, and then and a priority of that you would get, you know, you would elect to use those channels. So, uh, and if we if we if we happen to uh, 